Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about the Pacific War, or the Pacific Theater of World War II if you would prefer. How this war kicked off is already well established. Japan attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor to eliminate American presence from the Pacific so they could expand further across the Pacific. They then proceeded to eliminate the U.S. presence at the Philippines before moving further south into the Dutch East Indies, Malaya, and New Guinea. What I wanted to focus on today, though, is why this all happened. Why Japan attacked America. Why Japan needed places like Malaya and the Dutch East Indies. And why America was viewed as such a major threat to Japanese expansion. There happened to be a major sticking point between America and Japan that let all this occur. A central reason why relations between America and Japan deteriorated. That point happened to be China. We begin all the way back in 1898 with America's victory in the Spanish-American War. With their victory allowing them to annex the Philippines, America was now in a fantastic position to increase trade and economic relations in East Asia, and more specifically in China. China was considered a very desirable trade market to the rest of the world, and in an effort to prevent China from being colonized by other global powers, broken up and having the global market destroyed, U.S. Secretary of State John Hay, on September 6, 1899, requested from France, Germany, Britain, Italy, Japan, and Russia that all of them respect the territorial integrity of China and not block international trade ports, like the ones in Shanghai, Ningbo, and Guangzhou. Although the other countries responded rather noncommittally, Hay interpreted their responses as them agreeing, and by July 1900, the so-called Open Door Policy was effectively born. For the next 30-plus years, the Open Door Policy that called for free trade and free access to the Chinese market would underline American policy in regards to East Asia and China. However, it would be openly violated on several occasions by the Japanese with very little recourse. Japan had increasingly grown more aggressive towards China after the Meiji Restoration of 1868 led to a general modernization of Japan. Japan sought global power like America and the other Western powers had, and a great deal of that power lie in their imperial possessions. Japan would, through the expulsion of the Chinese from Korea in 1895 and their defeat of the Russians in 1905, annex the Korean Peninsula in 1910. In the outbreak of the First World War, Japan quickly moved to take control of German possessions in China, which resulted in Japan taking the port of Tsingtao and part of the Shandong province in northeast China. Still wanting more, in 1915, Japan decided to issue 21 demands to China that would give Japan increased control in China while also completely cutting out other global powers, from the Chinese trade market. However, as America learned of these 21 demands, they would intervene and signed with Japan the Lansing Ishii Agreement in 1917, which conceded that yes, Japan had special interests in China, but that Japan would respect the integrity of Chinese independence and maintain the open door. In 1922, Japan, along with Belgium, China, France, Great Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, and America signed the so-called Nine Power Treaty that said each would respect Chinese sovereignty and integrity, while also reaffirming the open-door policy. However, this wasn't really a binding agreement, and Japan basically decided to ignore it, and in 1931, Japan would stage a false flag event that resulted in them invading and occupying Manchuria in northeast China. America's response to this was akin to a disappointed look. America simply stated that they would not recognize any treaty or agreement between Japan and China that they didn't agree with. As you can imagine, Japan, having major territorial ambitions in the region, completely ignored this quote-unquote threat. Then, in 1937, Japan would invade China in full and start the Second Sino-Japanese War. 
Initially, America, and moreover, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, sought to send China military aid, but this was initially blocked due to the several neutrality acts America had passed in the 1930s. But still, by 1939, America, France, and Britain were supplying China with supplies and funding. In response to this funding, Japan would move in late September 1940 to occupy northern Indochina, now Vietnam, and take control of the Haiphong Yunnan Fo Railway, which was being used by America and the other Western powers to ship materials to China. At this point, it should also be noted that despite Japan starting their war with China in 1937 and repeatedly and openly disregarding promises and calls for Chinese territorial integrity, Japan was still receiving a great deal of raw materials and refined goods from America. In 1937, the year the war started, Japan imported 59.7% of its iron, 41.6% of its pig iron, 60.5% of its oil, and 92.9% of its copper from America specifically. For the opening stages of Japan's war against China, America supplied Japan with 54.4% of their weapons and supplies in general. So, despite Japan openly engaging in acts that were in direct opposition to American foreign policy, America continued to trade not only raw goods, but military goods to Japan. However, Japan's move into North Indochina in 1940 began cracking America's isolationism and supposed neutrality. In response to this move, America ceased all shipments of scrap iron to Japan and closed the Panama Canal to Japanese shipping vessels. The scrap iron factor was significant as Japan received 74.1% of its scrap iron from America. On September 27, 1940, the day after Japan took northern Indochina, Japan would sign the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy, forming the Big Three of the Axis powers. Not only did this clearly signal Japan's intent for military conquest, it signaled the ever-increasing importance of ensuring that China was well-funded and well-supplied, so they could participate in the fight against Japan. So, even with that railway in northern Indochina being under Japanese control, Allied forces continued to send China arms and supplies. To the west, in Burma, then a British colony, Allies would then shift to shipping supplies through the Burma Road in northern Burma. The Allies would land supply ships at Rangoon, where they would travel north by rail to the Burma Road, before then crossing over into China. Japan became aware that this route was now the primary one being used by Allied countries to move supplies into China, and if Japan were going to take control of the region, this lifeline to China had to be cut off. Japan's next move would effectively kill two birds with one stone. Their two birds were the fact that America was their main supplier of oil, and that China was still being supplied with military aid. Their stone was a move into South Indochina. This was made significantly easier, as France had well since surrendered to Germany in June 1940, and Japan, now being part of the Tripartite Pact, was in a fantastic position to quote-unquote negotiate with Vichy France. In fact, Japan had tried to negotiate with the Vichy government in September 1940, but France flatly refused their demands, which led to Japan invading northern Indochina before pulling out and coming to an agreement where Japanese troops could stay and cut off the trade routes. So, when Japan now moved to negotiate with the Vichy regime in July 1941, they would quickly come to an agreement for Japan to enter into a joint protectorate in Indochina. With this agreement, Japanese forces moved into southern Indochina. This move into southern Indochina would place Japan in a great position to cut off the Burma Road. Having a significant force in the south meant that Japan, at their will, could easily launch attacks northwest through Thailand and into Burma. Also, as the northern section of Indochina bordered Burma, Japan could launch an all-out offensive all across Burma. This is how their move effectively killed the bird of the Burma Road supplying China. 
The other bird was killed as Japan knew that their continued aggression in the region may cause America to cut off oil shipments. And as Japan desperately needed American oil for their war effort, they would have to secure other sources of oil if they wanted to continue conquering the region. Now having secured military footholds in South Indochina, Japan was in position to launch an invasion of the Dutch East Indies, which was rich with oil, so much so that it was the fourth largest exporter of oil at the time. If Japan could take the Indies, it would no longer have to rely on America for such a vital resource. In response to Japan's move into South Indochina, America made their biggest move yet to freeze Japanese assets, significantly reducing their ability to conduct trade, and in a more significant move, began restricting oil exports to Japan. Initially, however, the restrictions barred the shipment of high-octane fuel and heavy fuel above a certain amount. So, while this initial oil embargo was still rather limited, the reaction from Tokyo and even American press was strong. The New York Times called the embargo the most drastic blow short of war. The Japanese Navy, well aware of the effect that limited oil imports would have on their ability to expand in the Pacific, ramped up pressure on their Prime Minister to accelerate the plan to take the Dutch East Indies. If America fully cut off their oil exports to Japan, they would have, in a full war effort, a year at most before their oil supply ran out. Acknowledging this, Japan proceeded on a course that would have one of two outcomes, a peace negotiation or a war with America. A peaceful negotiation was the first outcome that was attempted. Fumimaro Konoe, then the Prime Minister of Japan, would go as far as making promises that he knew he couldn't keep in an attempt to keep the peace and prevent a confrontation with America. In late September 1941, Konoe went as far as promising that Japan would renege on the Tripartite Pact. In addition to removing their troops from Indochina and reducing the number of troops in mainland China, this offer from Konoe would be the most generous deal that Japan would offer, and even then, it still wouldn't have happened regardless. In earlier negotiations, Japan held firm on being part of the Axis powers and only promised to be independent in their role, for whatever that was worth. Additionally, Hideki Tojo, then the Minister of War, flatly refused any agreement that Japan would remove any troops from China at all as America would stand firm in their request that Japan remove all troops from China and Southeast Asia and that Japan leave the Axis powers, this left little chance that there would be any substantial agreement or developments that would lead to an agreement. Any remote chance for an agreement effectively vanished on October 16, 1941, when Prime Minister Konoe would resign from his position after his failure to negotiate for peace or even get a conference with American leadership. Two days later, Japanese Emperor Hirohito chose Hideki Tojo to be the next Prime Minister. Now having a military hardliner as their Prime Minister, Japan's offers for peace would never reach the level that Konoe would offer in late September. Japan's final peace offer to America on November 20th said that Japan would withdraw their forces from Indochina and promise not to attack any other country in Southeast Asia if America, Britain, and other Western powers stopped sending aid to China and lifted their embargoes and trade restrictions on Japan. America's counteroffer on November 26 would reiterate America's demand that all Japanese forces be pulled from Indochina and China, while also calling for Japan to sign non-aggression pacts with the other major powers in the Pacific. Simply put, America and Japan could not come to an agreement in very large part because of China. The Japanese military refused any agreement that forced Japan to leave China while America refused any deal where Japanese soldiers remained in China. Above all else, China was the main sticking point. After all, the current conflict with China started in 1937, and China's conflict with Imperial Japan goes back decades before that. Conquest of China, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific was their goal, and America, 
giving China goods and weapons and also having control of the Philippines stood in their way. So, on the very day that America sent their final counteroffer to the Japanese, the Japanese carrier force that would attack Pearl Harbor set off from the Kuril Islands towards Hawaii. Twenty days earlier, on November 6, Japan created the Southern Expeditionary Army, the one million strong force that would attack Malaya, Thailand, Burma, the Dutch East Indies, and the Philippines. This group was formed in the event that America decided to decline their last offer for peace. Of course, that would later happen, and on December 8, 1941, Japan would attack the American forces in the Philippines, who managed to hold out until May 1942. With America now directly joining the war after the events at Pearl Harbor and in the Philippines, they would progress towards more closely allying themselves with China. Both America and Britain, in an act of good faith to China, revised their past treaties, treaties that had been openly unfair and exploitative towards China, and made them more fair and equal. American forces would be stationed in China during the war, and in November 1943, America, Britain, and China would all meet for a leadership conference in Cairo, Egypt. President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Chairman Chiang Kai-shek were all present and affirmed their alliance and their military strategies against Japan. Relations with China would be fairly positive, especially when compared to today, for the remainder of the war and for about four years after. In 1949, though, the Chinese Civil War led to the rise of the Communist Party and Mao Zedong, which rapidly soured relations. But still, regardless of how quickly relations soured, and regardless of how poor relations are now, China was a pretty important ally for America in the early to mid-1900s. At first, that relationship was more exploitative and financially based. However, as Japan encroached further into China and threatened American influence in the region, China became a key ally, a second front against Japan in the Pacific War, and quite possibly an equal. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and stop for today. So, thank you all for watching. I think the role of China in World War II is a very interesting topic because typically the Pacific War is taught as a conflict between America and Japan. It kind of oversimplifies the build up to the Pacific War and ignores quite a lot of factors. But then again, at least here in America, Public schools don't really teach history all that well. It's basically all just date memorization, which is absolutely not the most important thing to learn about history. But anyway, I'll spare you the rant about how history is taught here, so I hope you liked the video, I hope you watch my next one, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!